thanks for taking the time out. Um, we're going to try and make this a, um, a weekly meetup. Um, obviously, with COVID-19 at the moment, everyone's got some spare time on their hands. And Oliver Bernard and myself are just trying to make sure we interact with the community and, and everyone, obviously, within the JVM space as much mm -hmm. as we can. Um, I'll just do a quick overview of obviously the market, COVID-19, a bit about JVM as well. So obviously COVID-19, the market's taken a slight hit. Um, obviously the economy and what's going on at the moment, quite a lot of startups are obviously reluctant to hire. But we do, on the positive side, we do actually have a number of clients who are hiring quite aggressively. Um, obviously they can offer, offer remote and onboard people remotely as well. So things like zoom google hangouts skype pair remote pairing exercises are, are really popular at the moment um and obviously it's a good time to hire at the moment there's a lot of people who have spare time who can take telephone calls can do interviews etc so um so we're working with some really good guys at the moment if if anyone's looking um so as i said we're looking to build this up as a community so i'll be posting regularly more on the the jvm site so we're looking at putting stuff like videos in the group to help people upskill. That's on Scala, Kotlin, Golang, Java 8, um, books, courses. I'll be doing regular polls from now on as well. Um, so why be keen if everyone could either drop me an email or post on the meetup group, anything, you know, anything they're doing in terms of books that can help people just really to bring people together. Um, and obviously we're looking for speakers pretty much every week now. So anything JVM related, obviously the benefits for you as a speaker and a company, um, all the people logging in are, are obviously experts in their fields. Great for promoting your tech team, your brand, what project you're working on, trying to attract talent as well. So a really good time to do it. We've got a database of over sort of 10,000 people just focusing on JVM around the world. So great great um, platform to get your brand out, et cetera. Um, so what I'll do, I'll pass you over to Mikel. So Mikel's head of um, engineering at Football Index. He'll be doing a talk on Kafka and Kotlin. Um, I'll, I'll pass it over to him now and he can run through the slides. Hope everyone enjoys, thanks. Thanks James. Hey everybody. So just give me one minute to actually share my screen. All right, that should be fine now. Right, so let's start with some slides. Right, so as James says, I'm Michele, head of engineering here at Index Labs. Now, Index Labs basically built this product called Football Index uh, in October 2015. It's primarily UK products. So if you guys are following from US, maybe you never heard of it, but it's actually quite popular. It basically allows users to buy and sell shares of football players, which are more like fixed term bets. Then you get like dividends based on, you know, the game performance of these football players and their exposure to social media. So as I was saying, like we got quite a few users, uh, about half a million, um, which basically all of them are in the UK. Um, and we are ramping up like you know, quite quickly. So about 1,500 of new users every day, right? Now their portfolios are quite significant and we got like everything from 10 pounds to over 2 million pounds for a single trader. And in 2019, the um, volume of trades was uh, almost like 650 million tons of pounds. We paid something like, 8.2 millions in dividends. So, um, why are we talking about Kafka then? Well, we're talking about Kafka because essentially orchestration, which is what most companies do when they lay out their microservices architecture in the first place, is kind of a mess. And the reason why it's a mess is because you got a lot of services and they all talk to each other using HTTP requests or queues or, or basically like it's a little bit ad hoc, right? So you end up with a graph that looks like this one somehow. And what are the problems with this? Well, first of all, if you got um, an HTTP request that goes through N microservices, then basically the availability for this call will be the product of the availability of all the microservices involved. And since the availability is less than one, that's not something we want. Then once again, like the maximum request per second you can absorb 
for a specific flow will be the minimum of the throughputs of the microservices involved in the chain. And also, like you either do distributed transactions, which are immensely painful. Like if you think about having different database types, I mean it's borderline impossible. Or you need to basically like cope with data inconsistencies from failures and come up with some reconciliation strategy and so on. Uh, on top of that, like as I was saying, like request this architecture works with push base semantics, there's no back pressure. Uh, really high load can kill microservices. You need the redundancy. Requests are transient, they're not replayable. It's very hard to audit this stuff. Like we are regulated by the GAMCON, it's pretty hard. And you get duplicates from retries, like with load balancers and so on. So, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is another architectural pattern that's called service choreography. Now, uh, how choreography works is that essentially you terminate the synchronous HTTP request when you put something into a commit log, right? And the idea is that from that moment onwards, you basically get like a choreography of processors which enrich that event and emit other events because of it, uh, essentially resulting in some push notifications, right? Now, this is much simplified because microservices don't need to talk to each other. They typically don't even know that other services exist. All they need to do is basically emit events, reacting to other events. So why is this like a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because essentially the availability for a workflow of N processors is the overall availability of Kafka, which was built to be highly available. It's clustered and you can maintain it, you know, it's simple kind of resilient to a split brain problem through and so on, right? And in terms of um, throughput, well, this behaves like a queue in this sense. So basically the maximum amount of requests per second your platform can absorb will be the throughput of Kafka, which once again scales really well. And of course you need to keep then your processor up to speed and make sure they are processing as fast, but you can absorb spikes quite well, right? So you got eventual consistencies or no need for distributed transactions. And you, you basically, everything is put based, there's back pressure. So the load is actually in queue and you don't need redundancy for the processors anyway, because you know, worst case, you can basically bring them back up if they crash and requests are actually there because they're durable. So you can replay them. It's very easy to provide auditability. You just provide the entire commit log to auditors and they're happy and you can come up with easy item potency strategies. Now, um, about Kotlin. So the idea is Kafka has two official libraries. There's one which is very low level, consumer and producer, which there's lots to configure, lots to do, lots to remember, and a lot of things that can go wrong. It's based on callbacks, which in general is not that nice, because you know, you've got blocking semantics, there's no back pressure. But it is decent when you know, your needs are quite basic and there is no external interactions when you process these events, right? So the other one, which is called Kafka Streams, very, very popular these days, is high level. So it's very sensible defaults, it's easy to use. You don't need to do that much. And there are streaming semantics and transformation primitives that also allow you to create materialized views and even window aggregations, which in general is not that easy. The downside a little bit is that you go like Kafka specific streaming API, which means that basically you are going to send around your components, things like a Kafka streams, which is not ideal. And also you go like blocking semantics for intermediate transformations, which basically means that this thing works extremely well when your processing requires no external interactions. But if you need to, I don't know, talk to a database for each event that you're processing, then the semantics are quite bad because it doesn't allow you to do non-blocking I.O. Now, Reactor Kafka. Now, Reactor Kafka is an unofficial library because it's not being built by, well, the open source Kafka community, but it's actually part of Project Reactor. So what does it do? It kind of is an alternative to Kafka streams. And essentially what it does is it exposes reactive semantics for intermediate transformations, which basically works extremely well when you need to do aggregations and you know, transformations that 
require external interactions like databases or queues or whatever else, right? It has better utilization of resources with non-blocking I.O. and it also exposes these events as a general purpose streaming API. So you can use it with Project Reactor or even Rx Java, but it's not like a Kafka specific stream. So the downside is that it doesn't support materialized views and Windows aggregation. Now with Kotlin, the idea is we can basically use Project Reactor and inherit all the goodness from it. And the idea is that by using coroutines and flows, um, basically we, we end up having a cleaner API because there's no need for things like flat versus flat map because this is language specific, so you're using the language uh, idioms. And also with structured concurrency, there's no need to manage and close subscriptions because basically coroutine context take care of doing that for you. And the, the processing is also quite faster because there's no need to create a lot of intermediate objects like the project reactor. And there's still no support for materialized views and aggregations. Now, before we actually discuss about aggregations, let's have a look at some code. Right, can you, I assume you guys can see this, but basically the idea is I have this test. So what I do in this test, just quickly to show how you can use Reactor Kafka with Kotlin to achieve quite good, I mean, uh, basically like very easy code is we start up Kafka in test containers uh, before all the tests run. And basically what we do here, we, we create a topic, uh, we get a sender for strings. So basically this sender is going to be able to send key pairs like string keys and string values. And we also create a receiver against the same Kafka container on this topic, which deserialize strings as both key and value, and basically is listening on a group ID. Then what we do is we create some records, and we basically send these records, introducing a delay between each of them. I'll show you in a minute why. And then for each of them, we log that we send them, and then we log when we're done. On the receiver, uh, we basically log each message we receive, we store the messages in a map, and then basically we acknowledge the offset for each of them. And we only take up to the record size because normally this wouldn't be there in production environment, but for a test, you want to stop the receiver after you receive what you expect to receive. Otherwise it would run forever. On completion, we also log that we finished. So when I run this, what happens is, you'll be able to see in the console that consumer and producer play nice. And essentially what happens is I produce and consume each event in order. Right. So what happens is, as you can see, I got the sender sent offset zero, the receiver received that, and the message is I, and then I acknowledge it, and it happens another two times in order, and then it says finish processing, and it's closed, right? Now, basically, I, I only added a delay there, because if I remove this delay, and I run the test again, basically the producer will finish producing before the receiver starts receiving. This is just like some basic lag that this introduces. And as you can see, it works very well with coroutines. You can wait for things to terminate with join all. And this is like basic coddling. So there's really not much behind this test. Uh, there you are. So basically the sender sent all three events and the receiver receive all of them and then they both finish and it's done, right? So back to slides for a minute. Now let's talk about state, right? Because this, this looks good and you know, like it works with flows and coroutines, which is great, but the downside compared to Kafka streams is that you don't have materialized views anymore easily. Now, why are materialized views great? Well, they're great because they allow you to keep track of state for fast in-memory processing, right? 
And, and how do you reconstruct this in memory state after crashing? Well, if you just have to reconsume all the events on that partition like since the event zero, well, it will take too long. So the idea is while reactor Kafka does not support durable state snapshots, we can still create them by using uh, this pattern, which is called read behind, right? So we can create disk-based state snapshots and, up, and basically read them in read behind fashion using LMDB. Now, uh, LMDB is basically Lightning Memory Map DB, and there is a Lightning Memory Map DB for Java, which is a library which allows you to interact with it. And essentially, it's a sort, kind of a sorted map backed on disk. So the idea is this, uh, as a processor, what you can do is you compute, you, you basically receive an event, you compute the, uh, some result from your in-memory state, which you keep in memory there and then. And what you do is you update your in-memory state and you publish an event on another topic along with the offset. Now, what happens is that there's another microservice in CQRS kind of, um, configuration which basically listens to this event and what it will do eventually is it will update the disk based uh, version of the same state you got in memory from the event so if basically the main processor crashes all you have to do is you have to read the state and the offset from the disk based state and you need to reconsume the kafka events only from the last offset using the disk based state which is very different from having to reconsume them all since the beginning of time, right? And, and basically, after you rehydrate your in-memory state using these events, you can restart consuming business as usual. So with that, basically I finished and just wanted to say thank you. And these are my contacts if you guys are interested in keeping in touch. So um, with that, uh, James, you want to open Q&A? Should I listen? Yeah, perfect. Well, thanks, Sam, Michelle. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I've actually wrote just on the chat panel, um, anyone who's got questions, um, just to write on, on there, then I can ask them myself. So um, if we give it a, sort of a minute or so, if people just want to ask questions on the right, um, and then I can ask, uh, ask away. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, perfect. One second. Um, also, as well, everyone, we, we are recording this, so we'll we'll have a link that we can send out to. Um, sorry, let me put my video back on. Um, we'll have a link that we'll send out to everyone after this, so they can rewatch it. And obviously, any questions, you can contact the speakers directly or myself. Um, but yeah, so the first question just from Matt: um, Could we hear more about the orchestration pattern in this context? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, is there no chance like we can put people on screen, right? Um, yeah, we can. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, maybe it's better uh, because it's not extremely clear what, what it means. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Um, I'll just find you one second. There you go. There we go, Matt. Um, Hello. Hey, Matt. Are you in there? Hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Oh, that's good. Hi, how are you? Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, cheers, no worries. So what do you mean? I mean, yeah, I get what you mean, which is I want to hear more about orchestration by in, in which terms. Oh, if you just, uh, because I haven't, um, haven't heard about it before, could you just quickly explain yeah. how it fits in this system? Yeah, yeah, sure. So basically, like, when, when it comes to microservices architecture, in general, service-oriented architecture, there's really two main enterprise patterns. Right? One's called orchestration, one's called choreography. Now with orchestration, the way it works is that a microservice, like typically an endpoint, receives this first originating HTTP request. And then what it will do is it will tell other services what to do. So imagine that you're, I don't know, we're talking about uh, trading, right? Like football index pretty much. Now you receive this request and I would say, okay, balance service, can you please like decrease the balance by X because I need it for pre-trade. And then you receive a response, which is like, okay, done. Then you tell, the point of trade service, hey, matching engine, can you match me this and let me know how it goes? And then you would tell some post trade, which is on our portfolios, and be like, hey, portfolios, now update the portfolio by Y because of X. And this is basically how orchestration works, which is basically peer to peer HTTP based request. 
this has quite a few problems. I mean, the first problem is that you need to know where all the services are, what their API contract is, and so on. The other problem is that basically if one of them is offline, so imagine that as an example, I decrease the balance by X, then I go on the matching engine and I get a match. And these things are side effects, right? So in those databases, the data has changed. Then I talk to my portfolio service and suddenly it's unavailable. What do I do? I cannot roll back because we're not doing distributed transactions because you know maybe those databases are not even all SQL. And the thing is, now I don't know what to do. Can I retry or not? And if I retry, was it item potent or not? And this is basically how orchestration works and some of the problems with it. Uh, I hope you answered the question, I mean. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit clearer now. But uh, obviously, I'll, I'll have to read it myself more about it. But thanks for cool. getting, giving Maybe me the gist <laughs> Drop me an email at my first name or last name, gmail.com, and maybe I can send you some links. All right, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put Michelle's email on after as well, just so everyone's got it and they can ask him questions directly, which is, which is great. Um, I've also got a few questions. Um, Mikhail, I'm not sure if it's all right if I just, you know, flick through or video share each person who's got the question, if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, is that all right? Cool. So, Arta, okay. I'll just put you on now just so you can talk. Um, there we go. So, do you want to ask Mikhail the question there? I think there might be something wrong with your, um, your microphone. Uh, can you speak again? In case it's fine, I mean, if you want, I can answer because this question is pretty clear. I mean, it'd be nice to see people, but I mean, it's fine. So, um, obviously, just for everyone, so so they can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Arthur's basically saying that you know, like this is this connection is really not working, but I can still reply to the question. Well, te testing this architecture is actually very easy for two reasons, uh, because essentially your side effects are confined to be the events you consume and produce from Kafka. So the idea is you never need to test end to end. Well, maybe you do in a minute, but the idea is you basically write contract test with inbound events and outbound events. So you can say something like, hey, spin up Kafka, put an event there. When your processor consumes this event, you produce some events out and you can check that the events are the ones that you would expect. And if you derive the side effects from the events, then you don't need to test for the side effects as well, right? So if you ever wanted to test end to end, it's quite easy because you can give your QA department a generic Kafka producer and a generic Kafka consumer, and they can basically put these two prods like everywhere in the circuit board and figure out if you do this, then here I get this eventually. I hope it helps. Perfect, thank you, Mikhail. Um, Obviously, everyone can see the questions on the right. So if we just do it in, in terms of order, et cetera. So um, oh, I think Rajesh has just mentioned that he's using Netflix OSS conduct before constraint, which is which is good. Um, and so. So Ad what's this? So, right. yeah, so I'll ask the question from Adeline. Um, can you please now elaborate on how you solve the problem in the scenario that, and. Uh, I think I mean. Oh, sorry, um, I, what do you do when one of the service services crashes and you can't roll back? Uh, where are we? Oh, here. Yeah. Well, uh, basically, basically for orchestration, that's kind of the problem. So, so the thing is, if you if you basically want to try and roll back, well, typically you can't, which basically means that you might be left in an inconsistent state, and you need to do reconciliation, batching, or inline, and trying to reconcile this data. Now, when you move to server choreography, the idea is completely reversed, because the point is that Kafka, as a commit log, becomes the source of truth. And that is your data. Now, the side effects will uh, derive from that in an eventual consistent fashion, which basically means that you never have to roll back. All you need to do is wait another little bit, as long as a crash service will come up, reconsume the events, and come back in line with the rest of the world in terms of data. I hope that helps. If it doesn't, I mean, feel free to text again or jump on a call. 
Perfect. What I do, everyone, as well, all the questions we're, we'll make um, a record of and we'll put on the group and I'll get Mikhail to write the answers to as well, just so you've got everything um, everything in line. Um, Matt just had one more question as well. Um, how stable is Reactor Kafka at the moment in your experience? Yeah, I mean, Reactor Kafka, I've been using it for quite a while. So I think at least two years straight in production. So pretty stable. I mean, I'm not using it yet in Index Labs because we're basically like migrating to it. But I mean, from my point of view, like bridging Reactor Kafka with Kotlin flows is really quite stable. I mean, here we're talking basically around Java bytecode, uh, Project Reactor is, is part of Spring Web Flux or this kind of stuff. So it's basically a standard these days. Cool, perfect. Um, I think that's all it for the questions, but thank you very much, Mikhail. It's, it's really helpful. And um, like I said, we'll get all the questions and answers out to the community after this. Um, and thanks for your time, mate. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. Cool. Um, so everyone, appreciate obviously times of, of essence. So the next person, Simon, he's actually joining us from San Francisco. So we're actually looking to obviously try and um, interact with as many people worldwide as we can, not just obviously we mainly live in London, but we're trying to get the community worldwide. So this guy, obviously, Simon, he works in Metabase in San Francisco, which is a startup uh, technology company. Um, and he's going to do a talk on closure. So the good, the bad and the ugly, I, uh, I understand. So I'll pass over to, uh, to Simon now to start the, uh, the slide. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so to just jump into it, like this talk is going to be, uh, I suppose, very highly opinionated and um, at least also somewhat closure evangelism, of course, but to kind of to give you, I guess, some context of where I'm coming from. Um, as James said, currently I'm, a, I'm developing Metabase, which is an open source BI analytics tool. We are probably currently the third largest BI tool in the world. We have about 21,000 companies that use us daily, including such as N26, Revolut, Swisscom, Confluent, and so forth. Um, and, but before that, I also like, I worked um, in various roles as um, a data scientist, including building up data science analytics departments from the ground up and help probably about 20 companies um, become data driven. So kind of my perspective is both from the now kind of combining the perspective of the tooling and the perspective of um, kind of just being out there in the trenches. So with all that said, um, kind of what became more and more clear as I was working um, as, like a, as a data scientist is that um, you should, like, the speed matters. So in my, like, the last position I had, we set up a goal that we should try to answer about 80% of the questions stemming from that data in less than 20 minutes. Now, what, like, obviously, the correct Sorry, Simon, it's Jake. I'm not sure. Sorry to interrupt. I think your line's a bit muffly. Um, would you be able just to just try again just so we can hear? But the idea behind it is that um, speed of answer matters. If you can answer questions like super quickly, let's, that's obviously ideal because. Is this any better? Yeah. Uh, can you speak again? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, is this any better? Yeah, that's much better. Thanks, Simon. Oh, sorry about that. Um, right. So I said speed of answer kind of matters. And ideally, you want it to be as quick as possible so it doesn't disrupt the flow of, um, of whatever is going on. This is how data can provide by far the most value to the organization. And then I guess the 20 minutes comes from the idea this is something can still kind of squeeze in somewhere in the day. And then as, as soon as it's longer, it means that it's probably not going to be answered immediately. And oftentimes the data is just not being used. So kind of to unlock the full value of um, data in organization, speed of answer matters. And so this is kind of something that has uh, colored my perspective on tools. And so kind of when I'm looking at tools, including like programming languages and data science, a big question for me is how to kind of maximize the productivity, how to get that speed of answer as fast as possible. And um, 
like closure kind of, I think here set, sits in a pretty unique position. So because if you look at kind of data science prediction, prediction, predictioners, it turns out that like you have kind of two perspectives. One is like people coming from essentially math background and seeing all data science problems as fundamentally math. And then on the other side, you have essentially programmers, uh, which saw it, see it as a programming problem. And like these two fractions seem to don't talk enough about it while it's actually kind of a much more of a spectrum. Um, but I definitely like I'm more on the side of the programming aspect. So kind of I think that a lot of data science problems are fundamentally about encoding and representing information. And this is something where closure shines quite a bit. So kind of a, as a quick overview, closure is a Lisp family language that runs on the JVM. It's functional, it's dynamic, and it's more or less fully mutable. Um, it has excellent concurrency and state managed derivatives and it's probably one of the best languages in terms of how good it can be for data manipulation. So as we'll see in this talk, like a lot of these features um, are very well suited to various kind of data science workflows and can help you tremendously. And it is like choosing tools is quite important. And like, I'm kind of saddened, well, uh, oftentimes kind of this default, well, if you do data science, of course, you should jump on to some, like the Python stack and that's it. Um, I think that in general, people don't think enough about the tools because affordances of our tools fundamentally shape how we approach problems. We tend to do things that are easy. We do them often and it's the approach we take first and things that are hard, we tend to kind of leave for last. And this kind of can introduce blind spots into how we solve problems. So it always makes sense to think about like, what your, tools, what your tools are doing to you, to your internal processes in terms of how you think about problems and approach problems and kind of interrogate whether you have some blind spots or whether you could kind of approach solving some of the problems better or fundamentally differently. Um, so like one example of this and it's something that kind of I feel for instance like Clojure can offer alternatives is um, just this fundamentalness of data frames. Now some kind of if most, um, environments for doing data science have some notion of data frame, but I, I don't think it's necessarily kind of should be the primary way of us thinking about data because it has like a big problem in that it kind of conflates representation and abstraction kind of it assumes this kind of 2D view of the world, which is oftentimes not the case or it's very quickly it becomes not the case. Like imagine the moment you do some kind of groupings or something, your 2D data is not entirely 2D anymore and kind of, and then kind of the whole abstraction starts to break and it becomes like more and more, um, tedious to work with and there's like more and more friction. But on the other hand, kind of closure excels at manipulating kind of raw data structures in different ways. So it oftentimes what we find when doing the science and closures, it makes much more sense to kind of stay in the more of like closure native primitives such as maps and vectors rather than trying to kind of shoehorn um, our problem into data frames. But of course it's kind of, I am aware that this is like probably one of the more controversial uh, things in this talk, but um, just kind of to give you, I guess, a taste of how it makes maybe Sometimes it's a productive to think about problems from a different perspective. Um, another thing that's kind of, I think, oftentimes overlooked, especially when kind of looking at libraries and so forth, is um, how easy things compose. And here, closure in of itself is already like, it's very good in terms of how it allows comp composition. And if you kind of pay some attention how we design our libraries, um, the whole thing kind of can grow like very organically. Um, so kind of to provide things like the ability to have current versions and then working well with kind of the pre-existing um, code composition primitives that Clojure has, such as like threading macros and the um, partial functions and so forth. And what happens is that now kind of a lot of your functions, let's say functions to manipulate structures that we talked before, can like very seamlessly um, be joined together, even though there is no kind of formal API towards which all agreed upon, but it's just kind of a consistent API been, done, been happening kind of completely bottom up organically just by every kind of library author or every kind of taking the same approach just because it's the approach that maximizes composability. And this is kind of a design principle that's um, pervasive throughout closure, like all the kind of what I would consider idiomatic closure tends to be rather good at allowing composability of different um, elements. Another, and another thing it does, like if you have this kind of a consistent way, I suppose, of composing code and like building things out of code and having a very code first approach to solving problems is that you can, can then have, I guess, secondary, like higher order information that's also encoded in that. Um, Closure and Lisps in general have this lovely property that they're very visual in the sense that you can kind of glean a lot about the program just by looking how it's structured, like all those parentheses, like it basically means that obviously any kind of Lisp program is essentially just kind of a massive nested data structure. But if you have kind of a, some, some form of sensible indentation, this also means that 
a lot of meaning is encoded just in how things are flowing, like what are kind of the blocks and so forth. And this is kind of gives you, um, this is something I always miss when working with other languages, it's kind of glancing at things, not even kind of reading it, but just allowing like my visual brain to try to process what's going on in a piece of code. Um, of course, kind of probably like the biggest thing that closure brings um, in terms of the data science process is the live programming. So kind of being dynamic and being kind of essentially wrapper first language, uh, it gets a lot of going for in that sense. And like, why is live programming important? I think kind of fundamentally it allows you to um, iterate faster and one of, and it's kind of in many ways, like one is just kind of, you can try out ideas faster, get faster feedback loops, but also kind of you can catch errors in terms of your thinking faster. Uh, which give like, and that oftentimes means that you have more context at your fingerprints because you can have just evaluate things as they happen and then something kind of explodes. You already have this context in front of you, at least like mentally and in the sense of the code, and that makes kind of easier debugging again, kind of iterating faster. Um, so uh, the other thing is that probably kind of the, is the ability to essentially share runtime. So what Clojure, as most of the other Lisp family languages allow you is to essentially connect into a live running process and you can kind of modify that. So you can essentially write Clojure programs that change or, um, or at least somewhat um, alter how your entire runtime is running. Like the example here you see on the screen is we are essentially um, in a Clojure in a notebook system. So sort of like Jupyter, but written in Clojure. And what we do is like when you evaluate this code, it actually changes how the notebook itself works um, and how it displays values, which means that this is kind of this very seamless transition between writing code and writing tools, or essentially kind of a lot of this programming is basically writing tools that will actually solve your problem. And because you can kind of connect into life process, there is no this kind of clear delineation between um, your data, your process, and so forth, and the kind of your code, but they all, seamlessly tradition from one to another and that kind of gives you a lot of power when it comes to tool building it's not some kind of a thing you do separately but kind of just as you go along and it turns out that this is a very um can be a very powerful and productive way of thinking about problems and how to solve them um but you might say okay but dynamic languages and so forth uh, that probably means that like um you don't catch many error like many type errors and so forth and that on the one hand, it's true, but Clojure also has its own ways of kind of dealing with that problem in libraries such as Clojure.spec, which is essentially kind of a data-driven or like a data description of types. And that also gives you like a lovely property such as that your data descriptions are kind of fully queryable. So again, the whole system is essentially introspectable. Even your type system becomes fully introspectable and you can kind of see why things, how are defined and how are not, or kind of even manipulate definitions as you go along and just kind of have everything at your fingertips so you can kind of pull out all the definitions of various data types in your REPL so kind of as you program instead of kind of even having to jump around which again is kind of a different way of, kind of thinking about this kind of build uh, no clear delineation between tools and your program because kind of you have this for instance like a tool that just pulls in data descriptions already available always when you're actually kind of building towards a larger program. Now, um, another kind of concern might be like for any kind of more, let's say, esoteric language or up and coming languages, what about the ecosystem? Because like, obviously something like, in terms of data science, something like Python has this massive advantage in a huge library ecosystem. And as for, like, I think a simple solution to that is just kind of farm it out. Like it's, there's even doing fundamentally data science enclosure doesn't mean it has to be entirely enclosure. Um, you can very easily kind of build like kind of essentially mini compilers that target for instance even the kind of specific library in their language, run that and kind of use the output of that just using some kind of in interchange program, uh, interchange format. Um, for instance, like the nice thing about libraries such as ASCII Learn is that they are they have a pretty unified API, so it's quite simple to write something that just kind of invokes the right function, and suddenly you have the entire ecosystem or just like a large part of it at your fingertips. And this is now kind of an approach that a number of closure projects are taking both interfacing with Python as well as R to just kind of extend the closure um, data science ecosystem because like there is absolutely value in having like kind of the latest and greatest libraries, which just kind of doesn't happen with if you kind of the moment you move from the languages that are kind of tend to be used in research. But this is kind of a way to overcome this. Also, like another example is like a library I wrote, like 
GUI.plot, that's a DSL that compiles to ggplot and kind of interacts with GUI REPL, which is a closure notebook system. And kind of, again, here you get all this kind of relatively pretty charts that if you kind of if you look at the code, take very little code, and it's like a very um, data driven description of what your code is, and it spits out kind of decent uh, SVGs using basically like open, starting a, an R process using ggplot and then spitting this out. And like immediately we've kind of extended closures and closures ecosystems nat native capabilities with adding red, like pretty plotting, which still kind of interfaces in a completely closure-like way with, um, uh, with the rest of your code. So I think this kind of a, this approach is obviously it's not limited just to closure, but again, kind of these family languages tend to be rather good at writing kind of small compilers. Rather, right? again, a lot of problem solving in Lisp languages is essentially writing kind of mini compilers, okay, you know, using a macros or whatever to write your own little language that solves your problem, and then progressively compile that language into your implementation language where it actually kind of solves the problem. And this is kind of the same approach, but just kind of taking one step further where your runtime is actually one step removed and you're using something else to do it. So kind of to sum up all this, um, I hope kind of view of why it might make sense to think about unorthodox options for your data science tech is that like speed of answer matters and kind of choosing uh, tools uh, has a profound effect on both like how fast we iterate and in what way we iterate. Even like, I think what the contest or contents of a single iteration cycle is kind of greatly depends on the tools we're using. But at the same time, like you're not, you don't have to pay the entire price for using something more obscure, like closure, because you can still inter interface with the outside world, just kind of essentially writing, having programs that write small programs in other languages and using their output for your needs. Um, and then like another reason why is look at closure is, it's fantastic at structure manipulation. And a lot of data science problems in terms of in other ways can be thought of as kind of structure manipulation, especially in the early stages where we're talking about like data manipulation, data preparation, ETLs and so forth. So kind of why not um, pick a language that really has a strong at this. And kind of last but not least, like the blurring the line between environment and work code is a very powerful idea. An idea I think we simply aren't exploring enough. Like a lot of, especially data science has seemed to um, converge on this local optimum of um, notebooks such as Jupyter, but I think like way more advanced systems and way better tooling can be built if we take this kind of fundamental interactivity and um, seamless transition between environment and tooling and kind of the problem we're trying to solve and think about like where this takes us and what kind of things we can build. And kind of with this in mind, I turn to questions and kind of any kind of discussion and ideas that this might have uh, posed. Yeah, perfect. Well, um, can everyone hear me? If anyone's there, perfect. Well, th thanks for that, Simon. That's um, that's really interesting. Um, I'll. Oh, sorry. There we go. Perfect. Um, I'll pass you over because I've actually got a few guys who who are keen to ask questions, and I think it works quite well in terms of interacting via videos and stuff. Um, so, so firstly from from Anthony, um. Simon, have you ever tried to use Clojure with Growl VM, that's G R W A L V M, and try to integrate it with Python and R? Um, I've used Clojure with Growl, um, but more just for kind of to exploring the side of kind of compensating for Clojure's rather long setup time rather than for a lot of kind of uh, cross language integration. But I know there are a couple of um, projects in that space that are trying to kind of trying to bring. Python and R more into closure through um, Graal. Like um, I'm still kind of on the fence because it also, it feels that like at least you lose some of the tooling uh, with Graal. So I'm not entirely sure if this is kind of uh, the best approach, but I also kind of, um, to be honest, like in the, I'm now mostly kind of focused on building metabase. So I haven't been completely up to date into kind of how to assemble your kind of dream team uh, ecosystem. So it might be that like something is starting to be there, but currently still like Graal is sort of a um, second class citizen in the closure world. Although it seems to be kind of improving because there's um, currently like an, a patch in the main closure repo that will fix some kind of incompatibility that was included with, with Graal. So even kind of Rich Hickey and the people like developing closure can seem to be paying more and more attention. So I think like if the um, entire closure world will 
start to look more seriously at Graal, we kind of we get more interesting uh, interactions there. But it's also kind of, I think, one virtue of this kind of very, I mean, in some ways, I guess, hacky approach to just kind of essentially spit out on our program is that um, it's kind of has very low friction. It's kind of something you just build as you go rather than kind of having to have um, various APIs and so forth to negotiate to bring kind of those things together. And like, um, and trying to also kind of have closure to work well with native Python and native R and so forth. So um, I'm like, it's definitely something I'm very curious about, but um, also I think that for a lot of, like, like a lot of working data scientists, at least for the kind of mid-term future, it's probably um, more hassle than it's worth because there is like some elegance in like the basic closure world where it's kind of very simple kind of to spin up either um, a REPL or something like Google REPL and you just kind of have that running. And then the kind of the more moving parts you add, like it does detract somewhat from uh, this value proposition. Perfect, thanks very much. Um, Stephen um, mentioned, can you link uh, to the libraries that you mentioned for DS enclosure? Um, I'm not sure if you wanna post that in the group or. Uh, yeah, or, or maybe I'll add them at the end of the slides and then you can share the slides with all the participants. Yeah, perfect, that'd be great and I'll, I'll put it on the group. Um, another question from Arta, um, what kind of data science problems would you attempt with closure and which doesn't? Uh, I think he's missed off the last question. So yeah, first question, what kind of data science problems um, you would attempt with closure? Um, like all where you have, a, where a significant part of the work is exploratory analysis and or kind of munging data and preparing data, which turns to be a, like a, the majority of our workflow, unfortunately, where I wouldn't probably use it is if the work would be more or less focused around developing novel algorithms. There, I think that it just makes more sense to use something where it's closer to probably what the um, various like research articles are and things like that. Um, or um, it also kind of, there is a class of like performance critical programs where it's Closure is actually quite convenient because we have some rather nice libraries such as Neanderthal, which compile to um, BLAS, and those tend to be ridiculously performant. So it's not, even though it's kind of dynamic and so forth, so it, you might think that it's not as like fast as something as Scala. But at the same time, like if you kind of again drop down to something like BLAS, you can kind of write very very efficient but still quite elegant and closurey uh, programs there. So even like. Um, there are cases where actually kind of implementing a known algorithm without kind of the element of novelty and exploring, but just implementing an algorithm basically following some journal. Like I could still see using closure if it were kind of once it's very high performance code running in GPUs and so forth. But when like the moment this kind of algorithm development becomes more um, exp exploratory or academic, it's probably closure is not the best bet. Also, I suppose if you do have um, already a large library of um, thing of analysis done in some other language, it makes sense to kind of keep that just because kind of to keep in continuity and not reinventing everything. Um, but like for a blue skies project that like we're starting from scratch, I think it's kind of, yeah, it often kind of makes sense. I suppose it's just kind of, if you know that a lot of it is gonna be covered by pre-existing libraries, then it might make sense to kind of stick close to those libraries. But the moment you kind of want to have this um, exploratory nature and you're kind of not really sure where this is going, and then I think Clojure is a very good tool to do that precisely because it's kind of its ability to iterate very fast. Perfect, thanks very much. Um, I think that's all on the questions. Um, like I said, guys, I'll put the questions and answers on the group so everyone's got access to that. Um, you also have a, a URL link to, to this as a, as a video. We'll send this out probably later this week. Um, so thanks for your time, Simon. That was really interesting and, and much appreciated. Um, I'll drop Simon's profile over to everyone as well. So if you have any questions for him directly, um, feel free to reach out to him. Um, but like I said, that, that was our first week and it seemed to go very well. So thanks for, thanks for everyone involved. Um, like I said, we're probably, I'm probably going to start a panel because I'm not sure whether 7 p.m. suits a lot of people or people would like to do it earlier. So I'll start a poll in the group. Just let me know what time suits or is better suited to everyone. Um, and then I can arrange it around your schedule. Um, and like I said, if you've got any questions for myself, Simon or Mikhail, um, I'll put all of our email addresses on anything about the JVM market. Feel free to answer and hope everyone has a nice, e nice evening. So thank you very much.